exercise 211 takes us to learning objective 2 and learning objective 5. So let's read and see what we have. Classification of costs as variable or fixed and selling an administrative or product. Okay, so we have to classify some costs. Below are listed various costs that are found in organizations. We have 10 of them. Required, classify each cost as either variable or fixed with respect to the volume of goods or services produced and sold by the organization. Also classify each cost as a selling and admin cost or as a product cost. And it asks us to prepare our answer sheet as seen below, and I'll uh, recopy it onto the screen here so that we have it. But this is uh, this is the first uh, of, of this type of, of question that we get to where we're asked to do two things. Uh, to identify the cost behavior, which is variable or fixed, and the cost type, whether it's period or product. And we'll see that a cost can be called variable and product, or variable and period. So we're, each one is going to have two categories. So bear with me while I put the... Um, while I put the table onto the screen, in the meantime, uh, enjoy some music. La mirada activa como un layo, micrófono en la mano, como estamos en el rayo, payo, y nos toquemos bando, pero te obligan, nos pondremos de parte del que nos pague la priva, y tengo lo que tú quieras, lo que tú más necesitas, y te obsesiones del resto te olvida, y mira y de miras para ver para dónde tiran rimas que dedico a estas que con el raga te excitan, that wasn't too bad, was it? So now we're ready to start. So let's start with, uh, and I'm not going to put the cost item down. I'm just going to put number one. Number one says, the cost of turn signal switches used at a General Motors plant. These are one of the parts installed in the steering columns assembled at the plant. So right away, we have to determine whether it's variable or fixed, uh, period or product. Well, if each one, if, if the turn switches uh, go into the steering column, every time you make a car, you must put one of these items in. So we know that it's variable. And since it's going into the vehicle, we automatically know it's a product cost. That was easy, wasn't it? Let's move on to number two. The salary of the manager in charge of production at Research in Motion. Well, since it's a salary, it doesn't matter how many units are made. It's the same cost every time, every month. So it's a fixed cost. And since it's in charge of production, it would be considered manufacturing overhead, indirect labor, which is a product cost. Number three, salesperson's commissions at Avon Products, a company that sells cosmetics door to door. Well, commission, we know that a commission on sales, like 6% of sales, is variable. If you don't sell anything, you don't get paid anything. If you sell a lot, you get paid a lot. So the commissions would be a variable cost but it would be a selling and administrative cost. It says right in the question, sales representatives, right? Number four, insurance on one of Bombardier's factory buildings. Well, insurance does not depend on how many units are made in the building. There's one cost for insurance, it's fixed. But since it's on the factory building, it's considered overhead. It would be a product cost. Number five, the cost of shipping brass fittings from Graham Manufacturing's plant in British Columbia to customers in California. So we're shipping finished goods to customers. Well, every time we ship, if we ship nothing, it costs us nothing. If we ship one unit, it costs us the, what it costs to ship one. If we ship 10, it will cost more. So we know that shipping per unit is variable and it is not a product cost because the product is done now. It is after the finished good is being shipped to the customer, so it's a selling and administrative charge. Number six, depreciation on the bookshelves at Reston Bookstore. This one will cause you to think about it a little. As far as variable or fixed, does it matter? Will depreciation change if we sell no books or if we sell a lot of books? No, so depreciation tends to be a fixed cost. But what about over here? Well. It's the bookshelves that hold the books. So the business of the bookstore is to sell books. It's a merchandising company. It doesn't make anything. So because it doesn't make the books, it just sells the books, there is no conception of product cost other than the cost of the product itself, buying the books. So that is a selling and administrative. It wouldn't be a selling expense. We call it an administrative or an overhead expense, but it would be a period cost to the merchandising company. Seven. 
The cost of x-ray film at the Toronto General Hospital's radiology lab. Every x-ray requires film. No x-rays require no film. So we know that's variable. Is it selling or is it product cost? Well, one of the questions that uh, I, I didn't do, but if you had done it, if we flip back over to uh, uh, two six identifying examples of indirect and direct costs, we would have seen that uh, um, for a particular customer, a customer can be considered a product. And that when we do something around a customer, we attach costs to that customer. So when we look at uh, the cost of x-ray film, we would attach that to a particular customer. So it becomes a direct cost, a variable cost, and a direct cost of goods uh, of the service delivered. So we would call that a product cost. Eight. That one's a little tricky, isn't it? Eight. The cost of leasing a toll-free telephone number at Staples. The monthly charge for the toll-free number is independent of the number of calls taken. So take one call or take 500 calls, it's the same price for the lease, so we know that's a fixed cost. And it's a toll-free number for Staples. Staples doesn't make anything, it simply just sells stuff. It buys stuff that's already made from, from manufacturers and it sells it. So it has no product cost in that sense, it would be a period cost. Number nine, the depreciation of the playground equipment at a McDonald's outlet. Well, depreciation we know is a fixed cost. And since the playground has nothing to do with the product that they make, it's just an extra thing added to bring customers into the store, we know that's a selling and administrative cost. You don't need the playground to make burgers. The cost of mozzarella cheese used at a Pizza Hut outlet. You make no pizzas, you use no cheese, so we know that's variable. Uh, but is it selling an administrative or product? Well, the cheese goes on to the pizza, which is then sold. So you could think of the pizzeria as a man is in the business of manufacturing and selling pizzas. So it would be a product cost. And this is how we classify um, variable versus fixed versus product versus period. Uh, and we can see that uh, just because something is a selling and administrative cost doesn't mean it can't be variable. We see over here that we have a variable cost here. And just because something is a, a product cost, does it, it can be either, and we, the first two are product costs, it can be either fixed or it can be variable. So that's a, that's a good little lesson. Question 212, and this will deal with Learning objective number one. So let's have a look at what it's asking us. Greg Powers is employed by Gussie Company. I guess it's Gussie. Uh, where he assembles a component part for one of the company's products. Greg is paid $14 per hour for regular time. And he's paid time and a half uh, for all work in excess of 40 hours per week. Required. Number one. So let's work with number one. Assume that during a given week, uh, Greg is idle for three hours due to machine breakdowns and that he is idle for two more hours due to material shortages. No overtime is recorded for the week. Allocate Greg's wages for the week between direct labor cost and manufacturing overhead. Okay, so um, let me, uh, let me uh, uh, make a few notes here. No overtime is allocated, so that means we worked 40 hours. So we have to take these 40 hours and allocate them between direct labor and manufacturing overhead. Well, let's look at our idle time. We have three plus two, we have five hours of idle time and 35 hours working. So of this 35 hours, 35 were working, five were idle. And as you recall from the chapter, or maybe you don't recall from the chapter, this is how it works. Your regular time is direct labor. So we'll take the $35 and we'll multiply it by, sorry, the 35 hours. We can multiply it by the, uh, by the $14 and we'll get $490. $490, this is direct labor. Our idle time, we do not charge as direct labor, however. The idle time is manufacturing overhead. So we'll multiply that by the $14, that'll equal $70. And that will be charged to manufacturing overhead. And 40 hours at $14 is $560. So, so the employee, uh, Greg Powers, will receive $560. So for him, he doesn't care, as long as he gets paid for every hour he works. But for the company, he worked 35 hours 
regular, and five of the hours of this 40 were sitting around due to problems with, the, uh, uh, with, with either materials or with equipment. So we wouldn't charge out as regular. It is actually charged to manufacturing overhead. So there's question number one. Number two, assume that during a following week, Greg works a total of 49 hours. He has no idle time for the week. Allocate Greg's wages for the week between direct labor cost and manufacturing uh, uh, overhead cost. So let's start. We always start by writing down the total number of hours, 40. And then what we want to do is we want to partition it, 49, sorry, we want to partition it. 40 is regular, 9 is overtime. Of the regular, we want to break that down into the hours worked and idle time. And it says there are no hours idle. Even if there are no hours idle, get used to putting down that, that little, this little uh, uh, um, sort of decision tree that we're making. So zero hours idle equals zero dollars. 40 hours regular times $14 equals $560. And this is direct labor. This is zero, so we'll ignore it. Of the nine hours of overtime, there we go. How do we deal with that? Well, overtime is dealt with this way. The nine hours are charged two different ways. You have the base rate of $14 an hour, and then you have your overtime rate, which is seven, because it's time and a half. The pay is $14, so time and a half is 21. So these nine hours, uh, Greg will make $21 an hour. 14 of it will be considered just regular hours. Uh, sorry, the $14 worth will be considered regular hours. The $7 is considered the overtime premium. And now this is how it breaks down. Of the nine overtime hours, we multiply that by, uh, uh, by $14. That'll give us $126, and that is direct labor. Only the overtime premium for these nine hours, the $63, only the overtime premium is considered manufacturing overhead. So, uh, our direct labor hours are five. Our direct labor cost is five hundred and sixty plus one hundred and twenty-six. So our direct labor will be charged six hundred and eighty-six dollars, and our manufacturing overhead will be charged sixty-three dollars. And that's how we break it down. So we just to recap: forty-nine hours, forty is regular, nine is overtime. Of the forty, forty is is worked zero idle so we don't have to worry about anything here if there was idle time we'd handle it this way we'd be manufacturing overhead of the nine overtime hours the base rate is charged to direct labor only the overtime premium is charged to manufacturing overhead there is number two let's look at the final one number three number three says greg's company provides an attractive package of benefits for its employees this package includes a retirement program and a health insurance program. Explain two ways that the company could handle the costs of its direct laborers' employee benefits in the cost records. Well, let's start out with the most, uh, the most direct and most obvious uh, and the most practiced way to do it uh, for, for uh, direct labor. The benefits. Any benefits uh, are added uh, are, are added right to the direct labor base rate. Are added to the direct labor base rate. They're added right to it, so we come up with one number that includes all the uh, all the uh, benefits. That's the most common way it's done. But an argument could be made here that we have retirement benefits and health benefits. And that retirement benefits really depend on the hourly rate that you're working because usually your retirement benefits are a certain percentage of your annual income. So that it's easy to allocate to the base rate the benefit for the retirement benefit simply because it's a variable cost. It varies with the base rate. So the, uh, uh, the retirement benefits... This is where classifying costs as variable or fixed helps. The retirement benefits are variable with the base rate. If I make more money, uh, I put more money, I, my pension benefits increase. If I make less money, my pension benefits decrease. 
So, for instance, uh, uh, it's quite typical for uh, most employees to have a deduction of up to 6%, uh, sometimes as high as 10% off their pay, uh, which is then matched by the company as a retirement benefit. So if I take $10 off my paycheck, the company will match it with another 10 and put 20 into a retirement account for me. So it doesn't charge me the 10, it charges the, the, the company would pay the extra 10 themselves and then take my 10 and off we go. So that extra $10 would have to show up somewhere. Well, it's variable with the base rate, so that's why we may as well include it in. But, and, but you can also argue on the health benefits on the health benefits that there is a cost typically for having a benefits package in place and then the company pays for the benefits the employees use so you may have employee number one that uses lots of health benefits employee number two uses none so in this case, it would be difficult uh, or at least hard to justify taking all of the health benefits and applying it to each of the base rate hours when you might have 10% of your workforce using 99% of the health benefit costs. So for the health benefits, rather than apply it to the base rate, you could argue since this tends to be a bit more fixed and not so variable with the wage rate, tends to be a bigger fixed cost, that we can apply it to a manufacturing overhead as opposed to because it isn't variable with the base wage rate somebody making twenty dollars an hour uh, uh, and somebody making thirty dollars an hour the person using thirty dollars an hour does not use more health benefits than the person using twenty there's no relationship like that they may but there's no relationship that says that's so but somebody making thirty dollars an hour will cost the company more in retirement benefits than somebody making $20 an hour. So that's why when it's variable, you can charge it right to the base rate. When it tends to be more fixed, and it is somewhat variable, but it's more fixed than variable, it makes more sense to charge it to manufacturing overhead. It's all about if you can uh, figure out the behavior, the behavior of costs, uh, it sometimes gives you a clue as to how you should record it. So that's, uh, that's the way I would step through part three of exercise 212.